is a BCF5 data. So in here, so Frank Watson is going to give you a little uh, talk about emulation and writing emulators. Thanks for all things in. My name is Frank Palazzolo. I uh, just want to go over the agenda very quickly here. Um, I want to give a brief introduction of myself. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, emulation in general, um, and then uh, talk about an extended example of an emulator that I've been involved with for the past uh, two or three years. Um, and then I've got a demo, and then time for Q and A. Hopefully, we'll have at least the last fifteen minutes for uh, Q and A. Oh, I've got some handouts here of uh, the presentation. Um, you can get them now or you can get them later. There's only about uh, probably 18 of them. So, sorry about that. Um, I basically got interested in computers in uh, about the sixth grade and uh, playing around with the first mass produced pre PC kinds of computers, the TRS 80 and uh, Commodore F Series 64, Apple II, all of the above. And uh, I'd say that and a combination of uh, some, some video game playing uh, led me down the career path of uh, electrical engineering and computer programming. Um, and uh, then around 1997, I got interested in both collecting computers and also emulation. I uh, found out that there were people on the internet who were actively involved in uh, uh, creating emulators for computers. And uh, basically, I've been involved on and off since 1997. Um, I'll go into some of the various emulator programs, but uh, I actually got a little bit of a list. Uh, Name is a is a program that emulates uh, arcade games, point operated arcade games, and I was involved in writing the uh, uh, emulations for a uh, chip level emulator for uh, um, TI speech synthesis IC, um, some sound coding, and then uh, MESS is another emulator program that handles more or less what I'm going to talk about today, which are uh, game consoles and more importantly vintage computer systems. Um, the uh, a couple of different game consoles and probably about a dozen, dozen other miscellaneous uh, contributions. So, just real quick, I'll talk about what emulation is and isn't. Um, a lot of people, when they download these things or play around with the first time on the internet, they, they assume that it's actually a, a program translation process where you take software from some kind of old machine and have it running on a new machine. Um, it, it doesn't really work that way. Uh, old computers are really a sum of the old hardware plus the old software. And uh, what you're doing with an emulator is you're creating a program that acts like the old hardware. Um, the idea there is that the original software can run unadulterated inside of this program, and it thinks that it's running on the old hardware. Um, and of course, the side effect of that is if you, if you emulate the hardware correctly with your program, then the original software will run correctly. And uh, if you don't, then it won't. So uh, interestingly, that's, that's sort of a little carrot dangling out there for a lot of people who work on emulators and that you know there's a right answer, you know there's a right way to simulate this machine because the original machine actually works. <laughs> um, in, in this, I'll be using just the terminology host system, which is you know, a PC, a Macintosh, something contemporary that you're running an emulator on, uh, whereas a target system is the system that's being emulated. So why would you want to do this? One reason that's relevant to this uh, to this time is, is to preserve this thing, these things for history. I mean, uh, you know, it's getting harder and harder to, to maintain or even uh, get to see a real live vintage computer every day. And uh, when you when you preserve these things, you know, granted, it's not necessarily a museum quality preservation, but it's definitely um, functional and also uh, not any. Uh, it's much better than obscure. Uh, another reason would be to help repair a machine. I've done this on multiple occasions where the machine is not working properly. And by looking at how the machine operates and looking how the emulator can operate, you can actually fix things on the original hardware. Um, of course, there's a part of preserving history side, but it's also giving a wider audience a chance to experience 
at least in some form, what it was like to operate an actual machine. And uh, then there's the whole technical challenge side of things, where there are some people, some personality types, myself included, where it just seems like a fun thing to do when you're going to do it because it's there. So first I'd like to talk about uh, if someone in general is going to be interested in doing this kind of thing. Um, you really need to have the working knowledge of a programming language. And I guess I recommend C because it's, it's sort of the uh, useful common denominator language. Um, unfortunately, emulator programming is not really a good way, way to learn programming in general. Um, I know a lot of people who kind of would like to do both at the same time, but it's actually quite difficult. The second thing is you really kind of need to know about computer architecture. Um, at least the computer architecture of the machine you're trying to emulate. And then, you know, lastly, you need data. You need every, all the data you can get about the machine, um, technical documents, you know, uh, and especially any software associated with the machine, either software that's built in as firmware or just images, data images, that kind of thing. Fourthly, you really need to have a lot of time and a lot of patience. This is uh, this is something I've done for, you know, since 1997, and uh, most recently I just, uh, now I have a young son, and uh, it's getting harder and harder to find the time, unfortunately. Optionally, I, you know, I can't stress enough that having an internet connection is being important. It's, it's, it's really the way that you connect with other collectors of the machine, other people with information, doing web searches. Also, uh, it's the way you can connect with other people who are possibly interested in the same topic. Uh, maybe they've worked on, maybe they've worked on some things that can help. Um, if you can get access to the original machine, of course, that's the, that's the best. Um, if you can read schematics, it's another bonus. You can get data books on processor manuals, service manuals, and uh, you get really into the deep end of things with test equipment and uh, you know hardware specific stuff, drives that can read original media. So let me talk in general um, about the kind of things that have been emulated and are available right now. Um, there are you know, over 3,000 point operator video games that have been successfully emulated. Um, that's probably the, the, the most, uh, most commonly you know, occurred, most, most, familiar, uh, most familiar type of emulator, most emulated these days. Um, in, along with that, there are console video game systems. Uh, thirdly, there's this category of, of what we call vintage computers, which um, is really going to be the focus of the talk. So I'm going to go through a little bit more generalities and then I'm going to jump into a specific example. Um, so, you know, the kind of questions you have to ask yourself about the machine, you know, what kind of architecture is it? Does it use standardized parts? Is it all microcode? Uh, is there enough data available about the system to even try this? Um, you know, do you, do you have everything? The second thing, and I alluded to this with the internet comment, is you know maybe you can look for allies who can help you with this. I know that's really the way it's worked for me. Um, there, are, you know, lots of people who collect computers probably standing in front of many of them. And uh, you know, if you're interested in emulating this thing and you can get other collectors interested in the same thing, um, then you know maybe you can get the access that you need to the original hardware. You need to be uh, respectful and careful with the hardware, obviously, and. Um, Collectors also make very good uh, data testers. So. And then there are people who are actively involved in emulation programming right now. You know, uh, there may be somebody else working on it, thinking about working on it, teaming up. Um, you know, are there shared components that exist inside other emulators you can use? And uh, the last bullet I there, you suffer some poor programmer can it all for you. I also speak on that from, from experience because, uh, you know, I really, at the beginning of this project, and I'm going to uh, really specifically talk about next. Um, I felt like I was driving, but you know, the, the collector I was borrowing everything from really kind of gave me the motivation that I needed to get this where, where it uh, needs to be. Um, I'm really going to give a really quick one slide uh, talk about legal concerns. I don't want to get dragged down into that. But um, something you really need to be aware of if you're considering doing something like this is both copyright law and patent law. And uh, the original software that either came with the computer as uh, baked in or as media, is probably still copyrighted by somebody, no matter what you do, at least in the United States. And um, you, know, you need to be aware of that. Um, and you know, if you go ahead and start distributing stuff on the internet, there, there are problems with doing that. Um, at the same time, 
you know, there, there may be some patents that cover architecture of computers, although for the most part, patents all expire within 17 to 20 years. So as long as you're working with an old enough computer, you probably don't have to worry about any patents. Um, the, the rule of thumb I can say to use and whether or not to get involved in this thing is think about whether somebody else is trying to make money doing the same thing that you are. If, if somebody's intellectual property has value to them, then they're probably going to do something about it. Um, if it's completely abandoned, then you know you're on your own. So um, when you go ahead and set out to, to actually write an emulator, you've got some design decisions. You can sit down and write an entire program from scratch. You can build your own, but base it on components that exist possibly in other emulators, or you can use an existing emulator framework. Um, the trade-off there is how much control you want to have over the, you, know, you really want to do it all yourself so you really understand what you're doing um, at that low level, um, or you want to use an existing framework where you have the learning curve of learning the framework. Now, specifically, I want to talk about a system called MESC, which is a, uh, an emulation framework, um, stands for Multi Emulator Super System. Um, it's a multi platform emulator, it runs on um, many different hosts. Uh, it's what I'm calling open source in that it's available from, uh, you can download from the internet, you can contribute to it. It has a lot of built in functionality. And there's a, you know, lots of developers involved in it. So that's actually, if you don't mind sitting down and spending quite a bit of time learning that system, it's, it's a good way to do things. Um, very quickly, um, the MESC project came from another project called MAIN, which is uh, stands for Multiple Arcade Machine Emulator. And uh, that's a framework for emulating point out games. Probably a lot of people here are familiar with it. It was released in 1997, uh, written in C. There's been over 100 developers involved in it over time, and now uh, it has successfully emulated, you know, I've got some numbers there, 3,000 games, over 1,500 uh, machine configurations. And as an example of the kind of components that you have mined in that source code, there are about 26 different CPU families emulated in there. It's pretty staggering. So what happened, in, in May of 1998, um, someone looked at this framework and said, you know, we can game consoles, we can emulate vintage computers, we can do a lot more with this code. Um, but and there was actually an email message with quotes, I'm paraphrasing here, said, if we had game consoles and computers to make, we will make a mess of the source code. So that's the real origin of the mess name. People were afraid that it would get unwieldy. And uh, um, so what has happened? Well, they've had a new CPU port for vintage computers. And they've also had the need to add more dynamic functionality. A point operated machine generally is not a dynamic entity. Uh, generally, it's a piece of hardware that's static and doesn't change over time. When you have a vintage computer, obviously, you can have different peripherals plugged in, different kinds of software media loaded, and all those kinds of things needed to go into the infrastructure of the emulator. But it has been fairly successful, and uh, there are over 126 different drivers inside the mess. Um, very quickly, to pull up their homepage and just show you a couple of uh, screenshots here. Granted, there's going to be a lot of game related stuff on here, but you know, there's a series of Commodore, Commodore computers. Um, there's a Jupiter 8, there's a K Pro CPM machine. There's a Kim 1 with some nice graphics for the board. Um, there's a Micro B. There, there's a lot of things here. So there's a PDP 1 running an emulation of the original space board. It's fairly impressive when you consider this is just one, one program. Yeah, there's one with the overlay support. That's a black and white uh, vector graphics game. Okay, so let's talk very quickly about what's in there. Um, you've got you've got modules for various CPUs. You've got the idea of a memory map in general. <coughs> Uh, you've got emulation blocks for certain kinds of chips, usually something that sits between the memory map and the graphics or the sound. Uh, you've got raw interfaces to do graphics and sound in a cross-platform way. Um, you also have support for keyboards and keyboard mapping. Um, you, of course, have support for digital and analog game type controllers. And you have support for, uh, I should have said, vector and bitmap, sprite-based graphics, all the above. 
we also have some limited support for peripherals just to take your eyes. And I should say, you know, you can add whatever you want. You know, it's, it's not one of these architectures that really locks you out from doing your own thing. Okay, now I'd like to take it from the general into the specific because uh, when I first was putting this presentation together, I really was going to try and stick with the general, and I did for a couple other people, and uh, people told me, listen, you know, it, it's fine, but the real interesting stuff is what happens when you go when you sit down and try and emulate something in particular. People are going to be really interested in that. So um, this is where I sort of talk about the, the in particular side of things. Um, one other note is that I would say um, most other systems that you sit down and emulate, if they're a well understood system, then the, the hard part is actually writing the emulator. In the case of some systems like this one, there was almost no data about the original system. And so, see, at least 50% of my time went into actually reverse engineering hardware. And uh, there's there's just a lot of entertaining things that happen as part of that, so it's, it's pretty much all in here. Um, the, uh, the target system is called the uh, Metallic Intelligent Keyboard Component. Um, it was designed as, a, as an add-on to make a, a full-fledged computer out of a, uh, a game console called Metallic Intelligent. Some of you may remember from around 1979. Um, what happened was the short form version of this story is actually pretty interesting. Um, what happened was Mattel was selling their game consoles at, uh, at, you know, successfully, but as part of their marketing strategy they were talking about, just wait, this add-on's going to come and make a full-fledged computer out of it. And, um, well, you know, they kept working on it and working on it, and, uh, you know, no one knows exactly what happened, but my guess is they had uh, problems getting the cost down. They didn't look, didn't look at the computer itself. Getting the cost into a reasonable area, and also it may have had some more liability problems with the tape drive that was included. So, what happened was eventually the Federal Trade Commission got kind of mad at Mattel and said, "Look, you guys need to release this, or you're going to get uh, you're going to get sued reportedly 10k per month until you get something in wide distribution." So, as far as it went, is they made several thousand of them. They test marketed an unknown number of them, um, and then they were all recalled. And there were all, all the ones that were recalled successfully were scrapped. So I only know of about a dozen of these machines out in the wild. Um, I personally had about four of them from about three different collectors in and out of my basement in the past two or three years. So um, that really contributed a lot to being able to find out what this machine really is. Um, there's a picture of the game system. Uh, you probably have seen that before if you had all uh, um, known the history of uh, console being the biggest competitor of the Atari. Um, just quickly, internally, you have an interesting CPU in there. Uh, it was a General Instruments CP1610, which was a 10-bit CPU, sort of operated like a 16-bit 
and trying to orchestrate bringing the hardware itself all the way here and back was just a little more than I wanted to bear. Um, but there, that's a pretty good picture of it. Um, the idea was the game console would sit in there and it, it had a lot of uh, added functionality. Those are those are cassette tapes in boxes that were used for the tape drive. So what's going on with this system? Well, first of all, there's another CPU in there. There's a 652 in there. Um, so what happened is you have two CPUs now. It's a dual CPU machine. It had added a 16K by 10 bit of sheer RAM between the two CPUs. Uh, it added a high resolution text mode where you can overlay uh, its state relatively high resolution text over top of the normal game console operation. Um, it had a full keyboard and it had a sophisticated tape drive. Um, it was both block addressable, uh, random access, and it had analog and digital information stored on it. I'll talk about that later. It had a microphone for audio in. And it had a basic cartridge available, which was actually a, a Microsoft basic variant that was um, uh, modified or licensed somehow. So, why in the heck would you want to emulate this thing? Well, first of all, they're extremely rare. Second of all, it has an interesting history behind it. Thirdly, there were a ton of people who were interested in this thing. I mean, you know, like anything else, you go on the internet and you can, no matter how obscure your interests, you can always find other people. Did the same thing. That's one of the great things about the internet. But um, there are a lot of people who wanted one of these when they were a kid. You know, they got the game console and they were waiting to get this computer, and it never came out. They eventually released, by the way, a, a system that was a, a watered-down thing that they could say was a computer attachment that was made by another division to avoid getting sued. This is an interesting one. Uh, out of all the keyboards that I've been privy to play with, nobody has a fully working one. So the only way to play with this in fully functional form is to actually have it anyway. And then, of course, the, the enigma of the technical challenge. Uh, another reason is so little was going on. So what's inside this thing? Well, you've got a power supply. You've got a motherboard with a uh, brown chip, 6502. And then there was a chip that I labeled the mystery chip. I got a picture on the next slide here. Then there's another board with uh, the tape interface logic, which is mostly discrete logic. So here's a couple of pictures of the motherboard. I had to split it across two pictures without getting too. Okay. Yeah. This chip right here with the, uh, the some kind of glue holding it down, a heat sink, a epoxy to the top, and no label on the bottom is the mystery chip. And uh, it was an interesting story that I'll get to later. 6502, you know, various. I mean, this basically looks like the kind of computer you'd expect to see from something built around 1980. So, the first thing that happened was we wanted to examine what kind of software was baked into this thing. And, uh, you know, you had additional RAM code for most processors, you had alphanumeric data for the, for the high resolution text. And uh, I didn't show a cartridge. What happened is they kept the legacy game cartridge board and then added another cartridge board specifically for the keyboard component. Um, and there was only one cartridge that was ever available for that, which was from Microsoft and Mattel Basic. And then there were tapes. There were about a dozen of these tapes. Um, it's amazing the amount of software that was written for a machine that never came out. So, what happened? Well, I chose to use Mess as a platform for building an emulator of this, and there were a lot of reasons. Um, first of all, it can handle multiple CPUs. I'd say 9 out of 10 emulators that you look at that are single game emulators. People don't bother to do the CPU interleaving because there's no reason to. Well, MESS has that ability to say, I'm going to make this process for this many cycles, or switch every cycle, or switch every n cycles. That kind of capability is you know, trickier to code, and it's easier to even use someone else's. Um, of course, it has a 6502 module in it. Um, the sound IC used in the game was 98% the same as something that exists in probably half the arcade games out there from the early 80s. And uh, you know, it had support for the keyboard, it had support for the controllers. So, and I had previous experience with MAME and also MESS, so it was kind of a no-brainer for me to choose that way of going. So, let me talk about the mystery chip a little bit. Keep getting behind here. One of the early questions was, could you even emulate this thing without knowing what kind of one of the ICs was inside it? Um, I actually had a keyboard loaned to me from a collector, and it had thermal problems. You know, you fire it up, 
would run for a few minutes, and then the text would go away. And uh, so he said, can you fix it? Of course, said, send it over. And uh, so I had it in my basement and uh, had a can of the cool shot spray, spraying all the chips, and hit the one that made the, uh, you know, made it come back. It would heat up, text would go away, hit the chip with the cold spray, come back. So, of course, it's the mystery chip. <laughs> So I think bad news to call him up and tell him, you know, uh, I don't know about this. So uh, what, I, what did I do? Well, I just for fun, I kind of made a rough pinout by looking at the signals with a scope. I said, you know, this kind of looks like this. It might have something to do with it. Obviously, it has something to do with the text. Um, and I was about ready to give up, even though I kind of knew it had to be some kind of text video generator. It may or may not have been necessary to know the U.S. of that to make an emulator, but um, certainly it was necessary to repair it. Um, then I basically had this accident that happened. Um, I was looking at another schematic from a coin operated arcade game and looking at things that I thought was kind of unusual because this had this big chip trolling video of some kind. And luckily on the schematic, it drew it in such a way that the, uh, the pins were the way they look on the chip as opposed to having a logical view, you know, the way you really want it most of the time. It was actually a physical view of the, of the pinout. And I looked at it and I, much to my disbelief, I ran downstairs and got my other pin out and was kind of looking at my guesses at the signals. They were the same chip. It was just a total, total uh, unbelievable uh, coincidence. It was a CRT controller chip that was made by TI. Um, and they were still available from an obsolete chip broker. So I went, I, I have about I don't know, 10 or 15 of them and I paid way too much for them. And uh, now I, I can fix these if your keyboard doesn't want to go bad. <laughs> Anyway, um, then I realized, hey, this thing should be fully emulatable by now. It's not really lucky. And the guy got his working keyboard. So the first thing you have to sit down and consider is, you know, if the CPU isn't available as a block that's already emulated, then you have to sit down and write something that emulates a CPU. Now, um, obviously, you really need data books for this kind of operation. Otherwise, you're guessing at the instructional set. You know, it's going to be a while before it's done. If you do know the instruction set, the cycle time, and all that, then it's actually it's not too hard. It's just really tedious because you have to get everything right. And even with an emulator like a, like Mess that has a lot of sample code to look at, um, it takes a while. I got lucky because I've written one CPU emulator for my own standalone emulator with the system. And then I talked to a guy from Germany who worked on Mess to integrate it into Mess. Then I looked at what he did with my code for that. And uh, eventually, when it came time for me to write a CPU, Emulator that ran in mess, I had sort of, look, this is what I did, this is what he did. So bad. Of course, clock cycles are important. Important note is the first guy to emulate a CPU has the hardest job. Uh, right now, there's four different uh, open source emulators available that have CP1610 modules. So, you know, if you, have, if you have to sit down and write one yourself, if you want to, you've got a reference. You can write test code that runs the same software on both machines and look at where things go awry. And, uh, so you can verify things against someone else's model. That's something you can't do if you're the first guy. Um, I got lucky. There were already, by the time I got to this stage with Mess, there were two other open source emulators, one written in C and one written in Java, that actually had four of that processor. So um, I could use that and make sure the CPU for um, it. The graphics chip. Well, enough people have figured out how this chip worked by now. See, Remember, these chips are common to the game system, so I had an easier job with this stuff because there was already other people who had done this work. I just needed to get it into mess, so I wrote about half of it, and then I got really lucky. A guy named Carl Dav Kyle Davis who wrote this job I emulator said, I want to do more C, I want to understand how mess works. Is there something I can contribute? And I said, oh boy, is there? Uh, you know, I've been bogged down in collision detection code in this uh, video chip emulation, and uh, you know, if you already have a working group in Java, why don't you see if you can make that working mess? That'd be really great. And he did. So. Sound emulation was almost a no brainer. You just needed to set up a memory map between the chip module and that game correctly, and you magically would get sound. Uh, another thing that happens is, you know, you need to know the clock speed of the original system, or else you'll have timing issues. Um, they can be estimated, but they got, you know, if you have a oscilloscope where you have the ability to. Schematic, something you can pretty much get the proper numbers. Um, 
quickly, if you have, uh, you know, you have binaries that came out of round chips, you kind of need to know where they fit in the memory path. Um, you need to disassemble that in order to take a look at the code and see where it really belongs in the memory path. Just a quick aside on disassemblers, this is something that does, uh, uh, something I actually kind of think is neat because they're, they're actually really simple to write one of these things. Writing a disassembler is easier than assembler, it's way easier than a compiler, and you can get a lot of insight into um, some code that you're trying to examine by doing that. Um, obviously, it, it, it generates assembly from machine code. Um, I wrote DASM 1600, which is the only disassembler for the C1610 processor that's uh, uh, available to the general public now. Um, and uh, I'm also partial to a tool called DASM X, which, you know, if you're dealing with only 8 bit processors that have known instruction sets, that does probably a dozen, 15 different CPU types with one of these programs. Or right now. Okay, let's talk about the shared RAM. There were a couple of different people who actually figured out that this RAM was shared. Um, the CB1610 sees it as 10 bit wide RAM. 6502 has two different ranges where it sees it as 8 bit RAM and then 2 bit RAM. Mostly the 2 bit RAM is just used to pass some control information back and forth between the two processors. Uh, very quickly, that's another thing you obviously have to get right is the interrupts. Video interrupts are something that's usually baked into the emulation framework with a certain standard uh, video interrupt rate. Um, it gets more complicated when you have something like a tape drive doing interrupts or there's this machine architecture that has the ability for external cartridges to do interrupts even though they never used it. This was all just sort of figured out after the fact by, by um, figuring out things about the hardware and the tape interface to work. Um, <coughs> then of course there was a the CRT controller that was a mystery solved. Um, actually, you didn't really need to know much about that in order to get it to be simulated. I mean, it doesn't do that much, so that can't be duplicated in software, but it was, I felt much better having it in the code saying, this is this CRT controller chip, it's a real thing, and um, we, you know, managed the documentation on it later on. So what happened? We get all this thing hooked up. Um, basically, the keyboard component emulator would work. It could do, it could do everything but access the tape drive. Unfortunately, you know, almost all the software is available to the tape drive. So it works, but you don't have a way of getting code in and out of it. You can run basic programs, you can type them in yourself. It was worked well enough to run cartridges that were for the legacy game system. But the interesting point is, it got to this point, and that is all that the existing keyboard components can do in the file. Because like I said, I had multiple of these things to examine. Every one of them had some level of mechanical problems with the tape drive. Unfortunately, none of them could maintain uh, play speed, for one thing, um, and a lot of them failed in such a way that when they start to play, and uh, the tape gets fed into the mechanism, but it doesn't get taken up by the mechanism, which provides the uh, fun result of you know tape just spewing out and drop. And uh, this thing never ships. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I got a chance to talk to some of the original people who used the system, and. Uh, you know, they said, that sounds about right, you know, the tapes were kind of quirky, so, um, you know, I think that's probably one of the reasons why it didn't work, why they didn't sell it. Uh, this is a really good one. This is my second story. Um, how the heck did you figure out what the tape drive hardware does? Mind you, there was a tape drive and a board full of discrete logic, mostly discrete logic, that did some sort of interface. Well, I spent a lot of time actually trying to make a schematic for that tape interface. And uh, in fact, I remember at one point I had a business trip I was on, and you know, I don't think I could get away with this now, but I brought a board and a multimeter and some paper with me through the airport, you know, through the security scanning. Uh, <laughs> it's headed on my train table, and I was, you know, measuring continuity between points and making little notes in the book. People were looking at me kind of funny, but, uh, you know, it was something to do. It came on a plane ride. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I'm afraid at least those days are gone. <laughs> Um, meanwhile, I had some of the other people who were really interested in this were looking at the software and trying to figure out at least what ports the tape drive existed at in the software map. And I was trying to make the schematic of the tape drive board. But, you know, it was starting to look like we am never going to do this whole thing out. Um, I realized that if I could create, if I could write some debug code that would run on the 6502, then I could, you know, twiddle bits and see what the hardware does. I could with the hardware and see what the bits do, and I could probably get this whole thing solved. But I didn't really want to sit down and write a, a 
debugger for a 6502 that I could load into the hardware. So, uh, what happened? Well, I have Steve Wozniak to the rescue there for a reason. Uh, what I did is I managed it, and I thought well, Apple II was based on 6502. And Apple II has a very nice um, debugger that built in originally that you can sit there and it actually has a disassembly built in. And, uh, Steve Wozniak wrote it, you know. Um, basically, the only thing that I needed to do was it, it would. Uh, Found the code on that. I have an Apple II, so it's my own little copy. Uh, I had to uh, reassemble the thing in the 6502 assembler, but I needed to redirect the I/O instead of writing to the screen of an Apple II and reading from the keyboard on an Apple II. I needed to make it read from the keyboard components keyboard and write to the high-resolution text CRT controller in the keyboard phone. And uh, luckily, you know, there was, like I said, there was someone else helping. Joe Joe Spichek. Spichek. Um, was helping, and uh, he was looking at the code, and he had looked at enough of the code to find the routines, reading the key from the keyboard, writing, writing character to the screen. You know, there were high-level functions available, so it was a matter of just catching the vectors. Had to write a bootstrap loader, so I had to put it into the standard uh, uh, cassette, uh, standard cartridge port for the game system, and have it loaded into the shared RAM and start the see if I will keep running, and it worked, which was which was very amazing. Um, uh, the question was where did I get a RAM cartridge? There was actually somebody selling, maybe still selling, a yeah, RAM cartridge, uh, Chad Shell's uh, Shell's electronics for the television game system. I had one of those. Uh, as a side note, it doesn't work with a keyboard phone. So uh, there was a problem when they suddenly changed the pins on the uh, cartridge board. So I had to modify my uh, IntelliCharger, right? That's the name of it? IntelliCart? Um, until it hurt. I had to modify that guy so that I could power it up while I was connected to the keyboard components. But anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and change. So here's my bootstrap loader. It looks like, you know, if you've ever seen a television game system, all the screens kind of look the same. I, I catch it, you know, give credit where credit is due here. Uh, lots of over there. Um, there's some 652 disassembly running on my from your color TV. Granted, the motherboard is sitting bare next to it, and that's what's causing all that terrible interference. Uh, here's a nice, nice picture. It really looks like some dingy, uh, dingy area of my basement. When really, it's one of the nicer areas of my basement. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a keyboard component. There's some manuals there. There's a. This is the. Uh, this is the Intellivision uh, main game board component taken apart. It's, it's connected to the board, normally be sitting in the tray. And then the power supply and the rest of the case for that. And then uh, you can see the assembly on the screen there. So what happened? I figured out the entire tape drive, right? much to my amazement. Um, it was actually a, uh, similar to a standard cassette tape drive. Um, even more similar to what's called a four-track cassette drive, which is uh, something that you know uh, you still buy on eBay, um, used for mixing music. And it's really, the only difference is instead of having side A and side B where you flip the tape, you have left and right channels on side A and side B, but they're all recorded in the forward direction. And in this case, the, uh, there are two things different. One is they use the left channels for data and the right for audio. And the, whereas side A would read only and side B was read right. Um, the other difference is that the data was actually recorded digitally and meant to be read back in digitally. It's different than an analog tape drive where they actually um, process the data to put it into an audio tape and back out. Um, you know, I think we figured out what the ports were for play, fast forward, I say we, I really do this one myself, I'll give credit. Um, play, fast forward, review, and it can sense whether there's data present while fast forward and rewinding, and it can also sense whether the leader is there or not. Um, so now we're in a situation where uh, you know, now I got 15 tapes full of data. I wonder what we can do with it because all the tape drives are broken. Can't just, the original plan A was put the tape in the working tape drive, get the bits off of it that way, transfer it onto the PC or something, and, and roll with it. But, you know, once I found out that the, two, the last two of the four uh, keyboard components were broken, I knew that uh, I was going to have a plan B. What I ended up doing is I wrote about five or six programs that. We dump the things with a standard cassette deck and then just start processing the heck 
data, try to find out what's going on. And as it turns out, there's there are actually sections where data was missing. So again, I thought all hope was lost. Um, I could look at the format though. You can see it's about three kilobits per second, which is pretty fast for a for a standard tape drive. For a digital tape drive, I, I assume it was doable. Um, you had frames. Interestingly, you had frames of. I'll just get through this really fast. 37 bits in a row, 5 sync bits, 32 gigabits, and then what seemed to be blocks of 15 frames. But like I said, there were sections that were missing. So, and all, since all drives were mostly dead, I was in trouble. Anyway, like I said, I wanted to do the direct approach, I had to do the software DSP type approach. Um, well, and in addition, you could look at the code and say, what does the code do with the bits once it reads it off the tape? First thing I discovered was that the blocks were interleaved. Um, what that means, people who aren't familiar with that, is you may read 32 bits in, in sets of 15, but internally the software reads that as sets of 15 bits with blocks of 32. It's like taking a matrix and, and, and transposing it, right? reversing all the rows and columns. Once I saw that, I started to think that maybe there's something else going on. Um, especially because there were 15 bits of data per block, and there was only a 10-bit processor in the machine. Sure enough, between myself and, and, and Joe, uh, looking back at this data, we figured out there are only 10 bits of data, and the 5 bits are actually error correction bits. So that like a like CD, if you scratch a CD, you can lose some of the bits, and CD still plays fine, because there's error correction bits built in that you can use to, re to uh, restore the original data. Well, once we realized that, I realized that there could be areas where the tape was lost 15 bits in a row, and with proper processing, you can still bring it back. Um, that's with the combination of the interleaver and the error correction bits. So uh, this is where I say, you know, this was a particularly deep dive emulation project, and this stuff doesn't really have to do with emulation, it's more about reverse engineering hardware and software. But once you figured out that if the errors were correctable, you can rescue all the software. So um, right now, I only have one image completely decoded because the process is still a little bit manually with the six programs. I need seven programs. Um, there's about a dozen of these software programs to go. I've got just uh, some Xeroxes of the programs that were available. The one that I worked on is uh, family budgeting. You do your budget. Uh, basically, there, there, there are two assembly language tapes that I haven't gotten to yet. But they are um, they're really interesting because they have they take advantage of both the audio and the basic side of things. Um, one of them is Jack Lane's physical conditioning. My goal is to get that one processed in time uh, so that Jack Lane might be able to see it. So they obviously they got him to do all the voiceovers and everything like that and never released the thing. So it's, it's pretty entertaining just to listen to the tapes. Could this thing actually sync the tape to a voice track and then play the audio through the TV? Is that what it did? Yeah, you could sync the digital and analog tracks together because they were they were all they were all there. You can sense where the data is. Um, I'll, I'll get more into that in a minute, I think. So, um, and the other one is a, a conversational French tape, which you know you can hear the French, you can say the French. Words it on the tape, it plays your voice back to you, trying to exploit the, uh, the idea of, you know, this is what we can do with the digital analog drive, isn't it great? And then the other ones are all basic, so basic never took advantage of the voice stuff. But uh, this is an example of a basic tape. And uh, I have a demonstration. But first, I'd like to thank uh, these six people, especially because they're all involved in the project. Joe, Joe is probably the one who knows the most about the television hardware right now, uh, the game system. Dan Blitz is a collector who has two keyboard components and every tape that was made available. Um, John Dahlia, and he, he's the guy who wrote another emulator for Home Down Lot. Kyle Davis, I mentioned, he wrote uh, part of the graphics code that's in Maine and another emulator. Carl Mueller wrote the original television emulator that became a commercial uh, project. And then Willie Moore was, was one of these go between guys who helped out a lot with um, getting people connected with other people. Um, so, that's it, and I'm going to give you a little demo here. And I can also take questions, actually. Did everybody see that? Uh, I took the liberty of actually booting the thing already. When you click reboot, you basically got this, and people who had keyboard components that could run them can see this screen. Now, uh, this is the high resolution text mode, it's double <laughs> the resolution of the standard game component. Uh, the um, thing to note here is that this bottom bar is not part of the original system. It's basically a bar I added to show the state of the tape drive, and I can run the system with or without that. 
Um, it turns out to be pretty important for debugging and, and actually for usage. Um, to give you an idea, now you're all nice to me to type I. <laughs> um, you know, you had sort of this OS, if you want to call it that, that you could do a few things. Um, you could enter head cleaning mode for the tape. Uh, you could type things without being able to say them. You could launch basic if you had basic. If you didn't have a basic card to plug in, you wouldn't get that last menu item. Um, and you could load and save tapes that were meant for uh, as assembly language. I unfortunately haven't decoded any of those images yet. So uh, you can start basic. Actually, one thing I want to show you is this is still a game emulator because I have a in the standard game cartridge port I have a game. So if I hit C, you'll see it launches a game that uh, more people would be familiar with maybe. Software demos are always the same. <laughs> <laughs> This is the first time I've actually run this version of this build on Windows 2000 and uh, been having a little bit of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully he doesn't still have 
asynchronous timing issue, or timing issues? And the answer is it's, it turns out to be pretty important. I mean, there are isolated cases where you can you can have the timing almost completely wrong, and things still work. But um, you usually find out about it later that uh, something else doesn't work. Um, it's uh, it, it, it's interesting because um, there's really there's the idea of getting the timing right down to the cycles of the CPU, which is pretty much as far as um, as most emulators work. There are a few places where uh, things actually get into the read and write cycle times, which um, you know basically you're talking about parts of a CPU cycle, and most emulators don't handle that kind of thing correctly because they don't need to. But um, I have a feeling that if you go ahead and try and tackle some of the more esoteric computer architectures, you really would have to deal with those kinds of issues, especially things that can do uh, have slightly different timings for different versions of instruction and that sort of thing. Yeah, for those of us who aren't so hardcore, but might want to do something like run Space War on the PDP one, is that something that's achievable on a Windows platform or other current platform? With an emulator. Right. Um, the question was, can you go ahead and like download one of these things? And, you know, for, for someone who just uh, you know uh, basically wants to try some of these things out, um, it's an interesting question, interesting answer because um, it's it's not as easy as I feel it should be. Stand on my soapbox a little bit. You know, getting access to the emulators is the first thing. It's easy enough to go to the web and download it. The second thing is um, getting it configured correctly and. And, you know, some of these emulators, the mess included, really don't have the easiest kind of configuration system built in. And it's because most of the developers are completely attracted to the idea of doing the emulation and not making the GUI nicer. And uh, so, it, you know, that, that's something where it could use improvement. And then the, the third part is actually getting access to the, to the software that you need in order to make the PDP1 run. And, um, you know, I, I'm completely not aware of uh, the state of that, if it's something that's freely downloadable, if it's something that, you know, you can, uh, I believe there's at least one website where there's a, a Java emulation of the PDP-1 in Space War that you can go ahead and, uh, and, and play with it there, and it's sort of a web-based kind of experience. Um, that was actually, I believe, the basis for it, and that's the PDP-1 driver um, done in there. Thanks. Any other questions? We have about eight minutes left. I've got one uh, printout of uh, this presentation if you're interested. Um, you know, I'm going to be here all weekend, so if you can come up and talk to me about emulation or try and talk me into working on somebody's computer. No. <laughs> <laughs> My wife isn't here, so she can't. she's not here to stop you. Uh, how, how, did, how did they use 10 bits and then 8 and broke it into 8 and 2? It sounds like they did more work designing this interface to the Intellivision than if they just built a computer. <laughs> but, well, you know, there's really something you said about that. You know, you started with a computer design from scratch. And, uh, you know, they could have built it all around one CPU. The 1610 is pretty slow in that machine. So it's like an 894 kilohertz processor. And uh, the, uh, the, so trying to control the tape drive and handle that stuff, and they probably would have been scrapped. They also would have not been able to buy a Microsoft Basic. I bet they didn't have a Microsoft Basic ready to go at, at, uh, for the 1610. Um, so, you know, use the 16502, do the shared memory thing, then you can get the basic. You can, it, it works from a marketing standpoint. Um, I don't know. I, I don't have a lot of insight into that. All I can really do is look at the design, the technology, you know, and, and sort of guess. I'm just interested in that they had, so they had the low order 8 bits in one address space, and then above that they had the higher order 2. Yeah, yeah, in a different block. Uh, they, they had they had the eight bit just a bit separated. Just the, the, the question about that. I mean, there's nothing you can do, right? It's only eight bit wide memory, so I think it's about what you can see. So you either lose the two bits or you, you, you map them somewhere else. So I mean, were people writing pro were there programs that were using both these processors and somehow the, the, the basic programs, the ten or so basic programs, uh, ran only on the sixty five oh two. I mean, honestly, the sixteen ten didn't do a whole lot. <laughs> the, the two real flagship programs that I'd really like to see running on this thing are, are like I mentioned, the Jack Lane thing and the uh, the uh, conversational French. And they both used, you know, graphics better than this. They used the graphics of the game system. They used the audio capabilities. They used the high resolution text on the keyboard. They basically those show the, the power of the system. 
after Mattel um, didn't want it anymore or folded. it. And this, is, uh, this is Tim Linda, by the way. He's another best developer. Who I have in this. <laughs> you got the front row seat. Um, the, the Japanese company bought it back and then tried to sell it themselves in the United States. Failed, and I believe they're all in a dump somewhere. Thanks. On the previous screen, there is a, a, a screen option. Type. What does that mean? That, that black box that popped up? No. Uh, when you did the index, there was an option. Was screen or screen? Screen? Yeah, what is the screen option? That's, uh, I have the documentation on that. That was, that was all it was. was you know, people forget how easily we were amused by technology in the late 70s. <laughs> Freeform type on the screen, kind of like the TV typewriter type of functionality, and uh, you could uh, you could access the graphics character.